Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? Happy New Year to all of you. As you have figured out, I am not Nate Gruber. He was... Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about Nate. We still love you, Nate, if you're watching online. Um, Nate was scheduled to preach today, but he came down sick, and even more so, could barely speak without coughing, so he was going to have to, like, mime his way through a sermon, so I just said, hey, don't worry about it, I'll I'll cover. So you have me today instead. So it's really good to be with you. We're going to be in Psalm 62, so if you have a Bible with you this morning, uh, go ahead and turn to Psalm 62. I would say what it is in the in-house Bibles, but I forgot to look and I don't know. So you can, 572 in the in-house Bibles. Thanks, Joe. Uh, So over the next couple of days, as life kind of kicks back into full gear and as people head back to school, head back to work, and enter into your normal rhythms of life, what do you anticipate will be the most asked question on Tuesday when everybody returns to life as normal? What will it be? How was your Christmas? How was your New Year's? How were your holidays? We will ask this question multiple times. We will answer this question multiple times. I've even asked and answered it a couple of times just this morning, and I'm sure many of you has as well. In cultural moments like this, uh, our exchanges with people often revolve around things we did over the holidays, interactions with people we had, experiences we had, encounters with friends and family, and the natural questions like, did you go out of town? Did you have family come and visit you? And so people have been asking me, and my responses have been, well, I had my brother from Florida come and visit. And if you were to talk to me at length about what we did, it was we went bowling, and he made birria tacos one night. He spent all day making this taco meat. It was delicious. His daughter made gifts for our kids, these beautiful animals. And we would talk about the week that we had together in terms of the experiences we had and the activities that we did. And, and we also recount most of our life in this same way. Meaning at, on Tuesday, everybody will go back to life as normal. Your kids will go off to school. People will go back to work. And then you'll come home at the end of the day. And the question will be, well, how was your day? And again, we'll recount the things we did that day, the people we encountered, the conversations we have. We, we often recount our life in those ways. And sometimes it'll get a little bit deeper and get a little bit more personal And it's not just, hey, what did you do, or how did this go for you? But the question will be, well, how are you? How are you doing? To which we just kind of slough that off with, like, I'm good, and we go along on our way, right? Well, in the early days of the Methodist church, uh, John Wesley, the founder of that movement, developed a discipleship system. And this system was based on meeting in small groups as uh, an individual would get in one of these groups, and they would meet on a weekly basis for accountability, for worship, for prayer, for the application of Scripture. And they also had a series of 22 questions that they would ask each other every time they got together. And the opening question wasn't, hey, how was your day? The opening question wasn't, hey, how are you? But the opening question was, how's your soul? Try taking that to work with you on Tuesday. (laughs) Like, people won't know what to do with it. Like, how's your soul today? People will be like, I I don't know. Let's talk about the Packers or something else, right? (laughs) But how is your soul? Like, forget asking other people that question. How often do you ask yourself that question? So coming in this morning... How's your soul? Is it hopeful? Is it alive and overjoyed? Is it anxious, overwhelmed, worried, downcast? How would you describe your soul coming in here this morning? I was an odd mix of anxious and excited because I wasn't anticipating to preach today, but as we got here, I was really excited to see everybody and excited to do this today. How is your soul coming in this morning? See, through the busyness of life, we can easily overlook and neglect our soul because we just got our head down and we're motoring through, especially through a busy month 
like December. But Proverbs 4, 23 reminds us to care for our internal world because from our internal world, we live our lives. It says in Proverbs 4, 23, out of your heart is a wellspring of life. But if you don't care for your internal world, it could easily become a desert wasteland. So it's important to take stock of what's going on in here. So as we cross into a new year, as you reflect back on 2023, as we move forward into 2024, how's your soul? Now, we might readily assume that our soul would be reflective of our circumstances, meaning if our circumstances are peaceful, we might anticipate where our soul will also be peaceful. But if our circumstances are tumultuous, we might anticipate that our soul would be chaotic and stressed and anxious. But what if there was a way to live so that even when your circumstances were tumultuous, your soul could be at rest? Is that even possible? Well, our passage in Psalm 62 explores that reality and shows how for at least one person in the Scriptures, that reality was true. This is how Psalm 62 begins. Verse 1, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. Now, if you're looking in a Bible, you might notice that there's a subscript right under the number, Psalm 62, right before the text actually begins. And it tells us that Psalm 62 is a psalm of David. And there's a pretty good chance he wrote this psalm while he was king of Israel. And we might assume that David's circumstances are great as he's writing Psalm 62 because his soul is finding rest in God. So maybe that means his circumstances and the kingdom of Israel at that time are full of peace and prosperity. He's just living it up, and things are going grand. But we learn real quickly that his circumstances aren't great. Maybe there's prosperity, but for him, there isn't peace, because as we keep reading, we quickly find in verse 3 that his circumstances are less than ideal. We read this in verse 3, how long will you assault me? And so David isn't in a season of peace. David is in a season of strife. He's in a season where he's under fire and he's under attack. And most likely it's coming from a group of people. It's coming from multiple people because he goes on to say, would all of you, all of you, not just one individual, but would all of you, like he's naming a group of people who are coming after him, would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence, surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place, and they take delight in lies. So the image that David is using to describe himself as a tottering fence, a fence that's almost falling over. Have you ever seen a fence like this? Like usually you find them in abandoned properties or properties that are neglected and people haven't cared for them. And you walk up to it and you're like, I, it won't take much. Just a little shove, just a gentle kick. And I could push that thing right over. That's what David is saying in terms of what he is feeling and how he's experiencing life. He says, I'm wobbling. I'm not steady. I'm barely hanging on. I'm barely standing upright because I have this group of people who are after me. They want to throw me down. They want to take me all the way down. And what might make this situation even worse for David is that they might actually be people who are close to him. They might actually be people he knows well because it says in verse 4, with their mouths they bless. So meaning David has to be close enough to them to actually hear the words that they say. Long live the king. Praise and glory and majesty be to the king. May God bless the king. But in their hearts, he says, they curse. They have to be close enough to David so that he hears their praise, but he also through his discernment is able to tell, to tell there's something that's a disconnect meaning they have some ulterior motive, and he's able to see that. 
Some people wonder if this is written at a time when David's son Absalom kind of overthrew him as king to make himself king in Israel, which would make sense. Somebody who's close to him, who maybe even praises him publicly but privately is scheming to take his place. Now, go back to this word picture that David uses, this tottering fence. Have you ever felt like that before? Maybe not because you're under attack by people who are close to you, who you thought were close friends, but have you ever just felt like that in life, where it feels like I can barely stand? I can barely have my footing, like I feel like I'm on the brink of collapse. In moments like that, is it possible to have peace? Is it possible to have rest for your soul, even when it feels like you are barely standing on your own two feet? One of the highlights uh, for our family in 2023 was that I had a, a sabbatical from my role here, which was great and fantastic. And we came back at the end of September, entering into October, just fully amped up about the future, just ready to go, super rested, super excited. And within a matter of days, our world was turned upside down. Because when, within that first week of being back from sabbatical, we, we lost Becky's dad to prostate cancer. And it was just like we were in this snow globe that was getting shook around. And then after a couple of weeks, we got on the backside of the funeral, things started to settle, and then Becky got COVID, which disrupted everything again. And then the week after that, one of our other daughters got COVID, and things got disrupted again. And then as we entered into the holiday season, our oldest daughter um, fell and broke her arm. And it was like, oh man. And the, the conversation when we took her to the ER was like, we need to double check and make sure that she doesn't need surgery to repair this arm. And so we had to wait for a weekend to go by and wait for the holiday to pass before she could go get it looked at. And we're headed into the orthopedic surgeon. And I'm like, you are not going to need surgery. Like, there's no way. People break their arms all the time. We go, they do one more x-ray. The doctor comes in and he's like, so you're going to need surgery. And it was like, man, it was like, woo boom, woo boom. Woo boom, hit after hit, blow after blow. The joke in our house was we needed a sabbatical just to get ready for the month of October and November. And in all these moments, the question is, like, if you experience a season like that, or if you feel like, hey, my life feels crazy, like, the question is, is it possible to have rest in that deep part of your soul, even when life is tumultuous. Now, you would think because David's life is tumultuous, because he's under attack and under fire, that his soul would be in turmoil. You would think that Psalm 62 would actually start by saying, truly, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of grief. Or maybe he would start, my soul is on the brink of despair. Or my soul is burdened and heavy laden and I'm weighed down. Because sometimes you find that in the Psalms. There are psalms of lament where people are weighed down and they're burdened by their circumstances. But that's not how Psalm 62 begins. It begins by saying, truly, my soul finds rest in God. And perhaps it's because David has confidence that even though he's in a hard season, God will see him through that season. When we read again, in verse 5, very similar to the way the psalm begins. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Now, I don't know about you, but when my life feels out of control, I might say that I trust God, but a more accurate description of how I live is that I try and control the situation on my own. Anybody resonate with that? Anybody else do that? In a hard situation, you might say, like, oh, yeah, yeah, all my trust. I'm believing that God will take care of me. But in reality, like I'm managing my life, I'm, I'm doubling down on those things I can control, efficiency, productivity, I'm hyper aware of everything I'm living you know, always trying to fix things before they even break. Because when things get out of control, I want to feel and focus on what I can control. 
And one of the things that is just this constant, like, underlying source of anxiety for me is finances. Not because we don't have enough, but because I'm always trying to control something in my life, and that seems to be the thing that's easiest to control. And coming into December, there's this heightened awareness of we're going to spend a lot of money this month, right? Because we've got family gatherings, and there's presents, and there's all these things. And so just as we, like, cross from Thanksgiving into December, like, I can just feel it. I start checking the bank account, like, on a daily basis, right? I start to interrogate Becky with like every little purchase. Where were you on Thursday? <laughs> Why did you spend eight eighty-seven at Starbucks on Thursday? Did you really need that latte? Did you really need the scone to go with that latte? And she's like, hey man, I just needed a caffeine pick-me-up. It's okay. We got plenty of money. But like I want to focus on the thing that I know that I can control and I get hyper-focus on it when life starts to feel out of control. So I might say that I trust God, but do I trust God alone? See, at its core, Psalm 62 is an invitation to trust God alone. It's an invitation to trust God only. It's an invitation to trust God in nothing else. In other translations of the Bible, the ESV you know, the Christian Standard Version, depending on what you read, actually highlight this emphasis in Psalm 62 better than the NIV does. Because there's this two-letter word, ak, A-K, that is used six times in Psalm 62. Six times. And it's a word that's hard to translate because it's a word that can be translated in numerous ways. And in the NIV, you see it translated in numerous ways. So verse 1 and verse 2, it's translated as truly. Truly, my soul, find rest in God. Verse 4, it's translated as surely. In verse 5, it's translated as yes. Verse 6 again, truly. In verse 9, surely. Six times it's used, and it's translated three different ways in those six times. And there's other ways that you can translate it. Completely, indeed, utterly, but the most common way that that word ak is translated is the word only. And other translations, again, highlight this because in the NIV, verse 1 reads, truly my soul finds rest in God, but other translations translate, verse 1, rest in God alone, my soul. In God alone, nothing else. Do you have confidence in Him more so than anything else, especially in a tumultuous season of life? Now, as the psalm moves forward, David names other things in which we could place our trust. If we jump ahead to verse 10, and he's encouraging us not to put our trust or our confidence in those things. We read in verse 10, Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods, Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. See, he's basically saying, don't trust power, position, or authority. Don't trust riches or wealth. Because all too often we run to these things to prop up our tottering fence, but they don't actually give us rest. They just distract us. They complicate our lives, and they increase our anxiety. I remember when our oldest, Kate, was about 16 months old. And we had this nighttime routine of I would read her a few books, I would put her to bed, I would rock her to sleep, and it was one of the highlights of my day. And so we'd get her all like bundled up for bed and she'd run through her room and she'd have to grab all her things, right? She had a, a little binky and she had a blanket and she had a book and she had her stuffed animal and she'd have a bottle and she'd hold all these things in her lap and I'd hold a book out in front of her, and we'd rock back and forth, and I'd read this book to her. And then when it was time for her to like flip around, I'd rest her on my chest, and I'd rock her till she started to doze off. Well, one night she had all these things. She had her binky and her blanket, a stuffed animal, a book, and a bottle, and she was like on top of me, facing me, and had all this stuff in her arms, 
And she was just agitated, and she couldn't find a way to get comfortable, and she felt like she needed all of these things to give her comfort and security, but it only made her more squirmy, and it only made her more unsettled, and she was just fidgety for about 30 seconds, and only when she started to let those things go did her breathing slow down, did her eyes start to get heavy, and she finally dozed to sleep. She finally found rest. See, we think we need all of this stuff, and somehow all of this stuff brings us security, and somehow once I have all of these things, then I will be able to really rest. But the ironic thing is it's actually when we let them go and we trust God alone that we will find rest for our souls. Because what David is trying to say through this psalm is that a soul that trusts is a soul that's restful. A soul that rests is a soul that trusts. And so, do you trust God alone? As you cross into 2024, do you know that there are things that I'm going to hit in the first quarter of this year that are going to cause me anxiety, fear, and cause me to be overwhelmed? Do you find yourself already starting to micromanage your life to gain control where you feel like things are out of control? The invitation of Psalm 62 is to let it go. It doesn't mean be irresponsible and just like, hey, I don't have to do anything. But to live open-handedly, to say, God, everything I have is actually yours. It's all yours. It's from you. It's for you. I'm just a steward of it all. So help me to trust you with everything that I have, but primarily to trust you alone. So David's circumstances aren't ideal. David has confidence that God is going to see him through. And what that does is it enables David to then counsel, to give counsel. He says in verse 8, trust him at all times, you people. Pour your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. So David is encouraging all of Israel and basically encouraging anybody who's going to pick up Psalm 62 to share his conviction that God will see them through no matter their circumstances, and you can find rest in him even in tumultuous times. But David isn't saying anything to the people of Israel that he's also not saying to himself, literally. See, one of the unique features of Psalm 62 is that it starts off kind of as a declaration, right? What you see in verse 1, and it's kind of easy to miss this, but before David actually counsels other people, he counsels himself. And you see this in a distinction between verse 1 and verse 5, because verse 1 and verse 5 are almost identical. Verse 1 reads, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. And that's more of a declarative verse. It's a statement that he's making that's true of his life. But before David starts to counsel anybody else, he first and foremost counsels himself. Because by the time you get to verse 5, again, the first seven words of verse 5 are nearly identical. Yes, comma, my soul. Which means David isn't making a statement about himself. He's switched modes, and now he's actually talking to himself. Yes, comma, my soul, comma, find rest in God. Notice the subtle difference. Verse 1, truly my soul finds rest in God. Verse 5, yes, my soul find rest in God. He's giving a directive to himself. And this isn't the only place where David does this. He'll do it multiple times in the psalm. Psalm 57, he'll say, awake, my soul. He'll give his own soul a directive and a command. He does it again in Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. He's speaking to himself. It's not David who writes Psalm 42, but another psalmist does the exact same thing. Why, O my soul, are you downcast? Almost personifying one's own soul. Why are you downcast within me? It's this constant pattern in the Psalms to see the psalmist speaking to themselves, speaking to their own soul. Paul Tripp says, the most influential person in your life is you. Because whether you realize it or not, you are speaking to yourself all the time. Anybody else have a conversation in their head happening all the time? If you're anything like me, you're always winning that conversation, aren't you? (laughs) 
even when you're talking to yourself. You're very convincing to yourself. The question is, though, what are you saying to yourself? Are you encouraging your own soul to put your trust in God? Or are you trying to scheme your way through a variety of circumstances? Uh, one spiritual writer says that when we start to approach our soul, we have to do it gently, almost like we're approaching an animal in the wild. He says, your soul is shy. Your soul wants to hide and be unseen, and so it's easy to neglect it, and it requires intention and effort to take stock of it. But when you do, sometimes you need to sit in stillness and quiet and actually subtly call it out. Sometimes your soul needs to be coached out of hiding. When my brother was here this past week, they, they brought their dog. It's about a year old. And as you might imagine, this dog was like, what has just happened to me? Like, where am I? I'm in a different house with different people. And the first time we went over to my parents' house to go visit, the dog was on high alert. And you could, like, it was in that posture of like, I don't know what to do. I, should I run? Should I hide? And there was a couple times it scurried away. And, you know, we love dogs. We're dog people. And so what we had to do was get close enough to the dog. Her name was Kaida. So that she could, like, see us, but not be threatened by us. So it was just sitting on the floor and maybe gently holding out your hand so she could know that you weren't going to grab her or anything and just let her come sniff and take her time. We had to subtly call her to us. And our soul sometimes has to be called and counseled in that same way. Like, it's okay. Because sometimes the things that are happening in our heart, we don't want to see. Some of the things that are happening in our heart, we want to hide from the world. But in only until we do business with those things and submit those things to God do we have the ability to grow and find healing and strength that God will give us to step out in confidence and trust Him in our circumstances. And so David here, not only is he counseling other people once he gets to verse 8, before that, he's counseling himself. He's calling his own soul to come out of hiding to turn from the things that are weighing it down, the sin that so easily besets it, and to find rest and hope in God. And then once David does that, he, he draws to conclusion why he has confidence in God. He says this in verse 11, one thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. See, the reason that David has confidence in God is because God has spoken, meaning God has revealed himself to the world. And there's often a correlation between knowing someone, trusting them, and ultimately finding rest or an assurance in that relationship. So go back to my daughter who, who broke her arm earlier this fall. When she found out she was going to have to have surgery, like all of a sudden, she had tons of questions. She's like, well, how does this happen? What happens if I go under anesthesia? What happens if I don't wake up from anesthesia? Does that happen? Do people do that? I mean, she just had all sorts of questions, and you could tell her anxiety was increasing. So we, we left the doctor, and I was talking to her, and I said, okay, so, so who you met with just now, he's called an orthopedic surgeon. He works on the bones in your body, and he specializes in arms. I said, I have a friend who you know who does that exact same job. If he was here in Milwaukee, he could do that surgery for you. And I said, would you like me to call him and you can have a conversation with him about this procedure? And she's like, that would be great. Spent about 20 minutes on the phone with him. He answered all sorts of questions. And then I said, after we hung up, she had even still more questions again about anesthesia. I said, I know somebody at our church who is an anesthesiologist. All he does is he puts people to sleep for surgery and then he wakes them up. Like, that is his job. Would you like to talk to him? And she's like, yes, that would be great. And so we talked to them. His wife happens to also be a doctor who works at Children's Hospital where she was going to have her surgery. I said, we can talk to her because she works in that place all the time. And she also goes to our church. Would you like to talk to her? And he's like, yes, please. We had three conversations. Every single conversation was the same conversation. It was actually the same conversation that the doctor had with her in the office, but she didn't know that guy. She's like, I don't know him. He could be anybody. He could tell me anything he wants to tell me. She's like, but I know these people. And it gave her another level of trust and confidence and assurance, and she was actually able to find some measure of rest going into her surgery. 
And so when we know God, because He has revealed Himself to us, we can find confidence in Him because we know Him. And we say, ah, He will be with me every step of the way. And God has gone to great lengths to reveal Himself. And the way that God has revealed Himself here is that He is powerful yet loving. And we need God to be both. The reason we can trust Him is because He is both. See, if God was powerful but not loving, He would be able to save us, take care of us, and lead us through tumultuous times. But if He wasn't loving, the question is, would He? He might be able to, but if He's not careful or caring and compassionate, will He actually do that? And if God is only loving and not powerful, maybe He cares a whole deal for us and wants to guide us through difficult times, but does He have the power to do it? He may not. It's important for God to be both powerful and loving. And where we see this most demonstrated, most visibly demonstrated, is in Jesus, even more so on the cross. Because on the cross, through His love, care, and concern, He lays His life down for us to take on the sin of the world. His love is on display magnificently but so is His power. Because even though it looks like death defeats Him on the cross, three days later He rises from the grave, blowing a hole through the back of death, saying, not even death can hold me down. So the circumstances that you're walking through right now, I can help guide you through them. And so even if my circumstances aren't great, I can find rest in God because I know Him. I've seen Him at work in my life. And I know that He loves me and is strong enough to get me through them. And again, it's a soul at rest that trusts. A soul at rest is a soul that trusts. And so how's your soul this morning? I think it's fair to say, what is it that you need from God going into 2024? Do you need His love to be very evident and palpable for you? Do you need Him to reassure you that He's with you, that everything's going to be okay? Or is the thing that's more so on your forefront of your mind, like, God, I need your power, I need your strength to change my circumstances, to change me, to open my eyes. I need your strength and your ability. What is it that you need from God going into 2024? And how's that affecting your soul? The invitation of Psalm 62 is to lay it all before Him, to find rest in Him alone, because we know He's powerful, that He loves you, and that He's good. So may you see that God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. May you find that because of those things, He's trustworthy. May you put your trust in Him, and may you ultimately find rest for your soul. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You so much for the reality of Psalm 62 and what it teaches us about finding rest in You, even when life feels turned upside down, even when life is confusing and chaotic and doesn't make sense. Lord, and we know going into 2024, at least the back half of the year, is going to be crazy and chaotic with the election. We know that that's going to start to build right from the get-go, and Lord, I just pray that we would ask You here and now to not let our soul get entangled in that, that as we step into 2024, that we would have a mindset about demonstrating your love and your power to the world, in part by a non-anxious presence, that we can simply rest in you and trust that everything is going to be okay, both in our world, in our country, and in our own life. May we have that deep abiding presence of your Spirit reminding us and when we forget, may we coach our own soul to say, hey, put your trust in God. Find rest in Him, because Him and Him alone is He able to give you everything you need right when you need it. Amen.